I'm going to say this about Dr. Cornell West. In life, we all have to make choices as to what we are going to stand for and whom we are going to stand with. Dr. Cornel West is perhaps the leading public intellectual of his generation. He has redefined the academic fields of philosophy, black studies, and religion. He is professor of philosophy and Christian practice at Union Theological Seminary and professor emeritus at Princeton University. That's right. He has written classic works, including Race Matters and Democracy Matters, and recent texts like Black Prophetic Fire and The Radical King. <laughs> now my point is this, many folks with similar credentials have chosen a life of comfort, appeasement to the establishment, and the material rewards of celebrity, but not Brother West. He is a product of, and now a torchbearer, of the black prophetic tradition. He fights for justice, and he stands with the people. And that's why he's loved. He's never sold out, and he's always been uncompromising. And that's why it is my great honor to introduce our brother, Dr. Cornell West. Brother Ed and Cozy, the boys and the son. Give it up, Brother Ed Cozy. Oh, yes, I'm blessed, to, I'm blessed to have this brother as my head teaching assistant in my course on W.B. Du Bois. You all know W.B. Du Bois is the greatest public intellectual in the history of the American Empire. Give it up for Du Bois because his spirit is here. Just like Sojourner Truth, just like Ida B. Wells, just like Marcus Garvey. And we don't have a language to describe the fire of Malcolm X. Hey. Martin Luther King Jr. I'm not going to talk too long tonight because this is not a time for words. Words are too cheap when action is necessary. But I do want to salute this space, this consecrated space. I want to salute our dear brother Francois. Give it up for him. Give it up for him. Thank you so very much for allowing us in this consecrated space. Send my love and respect to brother and sister Warren. Because I'm here because I am who I am because somebody loved me. Somebody cared for me. Somebody attended to me. And when I see these precious faces and I look in their eyes and I take enough time to connect with their souls and then I see the precious loved ones and the tears flowing. I say those tears are not in vain because we come from a people, we come from a tradition, a community who constitutes what the Isley brothers call a caravan of love. That's what it's all about. When you've been terrorized for 400 years, when you've been traumatized for 400 years, when you've been stigmatized for 400 years, but you're still producer John Coltrane who talks about love supreme. You're still producer Marvin Gaye who said, what's going on? Who cares for the children? Who really cares when you produce a Nina Simone that can talk about what it means to be young, gifted, and black when you produce a Donnie Hathaway who can raise the question of someday we'll be free in the midst of so much terror, in the midst of so much trauma, in the midst of so much stigma. That allows you to take a stand. And that's what we're talking about in October, what it means to take a stand. Now, there used to be a brother on every fifth Sunday in my church, the Shiloh Baptist Church, on the chocolate side of Sacramento, California. He'd show up and sit down on the organ. His name was Sylvester Stewart, but he's known to the world for the genius that he is, named Sly Stone. 
Y'all remember Sly Stone? And he wrote a call, he wrote a song called Stand. You've been sitting much too long. There's a permanent crease in your right and wrong. Stand, there's a midget standing tall and the giant beside him about to fall. But then he got theological. He says, Stand, there's a cross for you to bear. Things to go through if you going anywhere. That's where we are right now. The American empire is in decline, y'all. Capitalist civilization, market-driven, obsessed with narrow individualism, hedonism, narcissism, suffering from a spiritual malnutrition and a moral constipation. A coursing of the conscious and a hardening of the heart, a chilling of the soul, that callousness and indifference toward the suffering, especially the suffering of the vulnerable of the children, how can we live in a society in which almost 45% of all of our precious children of color live in poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world? That's spiritually profane. That's morally obscene. That's spiritually sick. 22% of all of the children in America live in poverty. I don't care what color, each one equally precious. Something is wrong. That's a key sweat moment. Something, something just ain't right. Brother Kevin, you know what I'm talking about. And we got these two giants here, Glenn Ford and Nellie Bailey. Oh, we got a black agenda report. Oh, keep track of it. You get some deep truths of what it means to talk about empire. White supremacy sitting at the center of the American democratic experiment and it was not the enslavement of black people that's the original sin. No, it was the stealing of the land of precious indigenous brothers and sisters. That makes it empire. That's an imperial project, a settler colonial project. We have to be able to straighten our backs up enough to do what? To tell the truth and the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. And I come from a people, when I say people, I'm not talking about folk in the abstract. I'm talking about Cliff and Irene, my parents. I'm talking about what I learned in vacation Bible school in Shiloh. That taught me to be a person of integrity and honesty and decency and have the courage to straighten my back up and tell the truth and to allow suffering to speak, but always put love at the center of it. Because if love is not at the center of it, it's just sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. And you discover that quickly. Because there's no way that all this suffering could be going on. All of this political murder and terror could be going on. The school system producing soul murder every day. Gentrification of chocolate spaces with power grabs and land grabs. 1% of the population got 42% of the wealth and growing. Wages are stagnating for 40 years. Where's the outrage? If you really love folk, you hate the fact that they're being treated unjustly. You loathe the fact they're being treated unfairly. And if we don't do something, the rocks are going to cry out. Unless, and here's where the challenge begins, and this is what I love about Malcolm X. Malcolm said, my only credential is sincerity. He spoke the truth as he understood it. Doesn't mean he's right all the time, but you can rest be assured that just like a song by Aretha Franklin, what he has to say is for real. It's coming from his soul. It's coming from his gut. And in the last 35 years during the ice age, the neoliberal ice age, and by neoliberal all I mean is financialized, privatized, militarized. You got a problem? Financialize. Bring in the big money in the banks. Privatize. Push out the public life. Push out public education. Push out the public conversation on corporate media. Just be concerned about the money. Money, money. Wu-Tang Clan say what? Cream. Cash rules everything around me, but it doesn't have to rule me. I can decide which side I'm going to be on. 
I can decide who I'm going to be in solidarity with. I can decide when I straighten my back up on the job, on the street, church, mosque, synagogue, if you're secular, if you're atheistic and agnostic, that's all right in terms of being able to still take a stand. I worked with a revolutionary communist for many, many years. I love him to death. His name is Carl Dix. I love that brother to death. I think he's wrong on the God question, but that's all right. I'm a Jesus-loving free black man. I'm a revolutionary Christian. He is a justice-loving free black man. He's a revolutionary communist. We overlap because we overlap in our love for these folk. Because we overlap with our love for poor people, working people, not just here, but all around the world. They could be peasants in Mexico. They could be wrestling with an ugly Israeli occupation that our Palestinians are. They could be dealing with tyranny in Ethiopia. They could be talking about how can I come to terms with my gay, lesbian, and trans identity in Canada. Doesn't make any difference. All of them got equal status in the eyes of the God that I serve. Same status. Same significance. But the problem is that we live in the age of the sellout. Sell out preachers, sell out lawyers, sell out pharmacists, sell out professors, sell out civil rights leaders, cross the board. Everybody's for sale. All you got to do is offer some money, little power, little status, and next thing you know, they change their tune. No, no, love doesn't allow you to do that. Now, I'm the kind of Christian who I love the sellouts as human beings, but I'm going to tell the truth about them. Because all of us got gangster proclivities. I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and now I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. So y'all got to keep me honest, keep Carl Dix honest, keep all the parents honest. All of us have those proclivities when we get scared. But black people at our best hated people but taught the world so much about love. Treated unjustly but taught the world so much about justice. Traumatized but taught the world so much about how to be cool. Black people at our best have been truth tellers, which means we've been cross bears before we were flag wavers. And that's part of our challenge in the age of Obama, that once we got a black president, we got too many folk waving the flag and not enough folk wanting to bear the cross. So many folk concerned with the breakthrough at the top and losing sight of those stuck in the basement. Those still catching hell, those wretched of the earth that the great Franz Fanon talked about in the midst of the American empire. That's what stop mass incarceration is all about. Black Agenda Report, y'all call it a mass incarceration state. Because black people, we moved from what? 244 years of not just slavery, but labor as a form of torture. It was against the law for black people to read or write. It's against the law for black people to worship God without white supervision. You see, that's more than a police state. And what do we do? We stole away at night and ring shouts and held hands and lifted our voices just like the national anthem called Lift Every Voice. And in lifting your voice, we decide not to be an echo, not to be a copy, but an original. Not to be an imitation, but to be creations and innovations, providing something new for the world. That's the tradition that we're talking about in Stop Mass Incarceration. But how do we do it? It's a spiritual question as well as a political one. And I'm going to end on this because, as I said, we don't need long speeches. But for black people, anytime we decide to straighten our backs up, to tell the truth, to bear witness, and be willing to live and die for something bigger than you. Anytime we decide to do that, 
powers that be start shaking. We could call it the process of de-niggerizing black people. That's what it is. But when you keep a folk niggerized, they're so afraid and scared and intimidated, walking around humpbacked all the time, not believing in themselves, not respecting themselves, not loving themselves at all. And when you don't love yourself, you don't love the people who look like you. You disrespect yourself, you disrespect folk that look like you. You become just a niggerized zombie, as it were, because you're giving up on your humanity. You believe the white supremacist hype that's been bombarding you through corporate media and through school and and through all the other institutions. But lo and behold, when black people decide to become de-niggerized, straighten up, quit laughing when it ain't funny, quit scratching when it don't itch, quit wearing the mask, be true to who God called you to be. And usually it takes about every 30 years because when the black folk who do that, they either get murdered they get shot down, they get lied on, they get scorned, they get rebuked. And the warriors are incarcerated. And what's left is just the milk toast professionals who want to be successful. And I don't come from a tradition of a people. So much blood, sweat, and tears just to produce successful Negroes. I want to know what you're going to be faithful to. How you going to use your success? What kind of human being are you going to be given the material toys that you have? What are you going to say at your funeral beyond the fact that you just had big mansions and a trophy spouse? What's the quality of your character? What kind of integrity, honesty, and decency did you really have? What courage did you manifest? How deep was your love? Did you organize and mobilize with others? Did you go down swinging like Muhammad Ali and Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughn and Gladys Knight and the Jones girls and the emotion? That's the question. That's why this movement connects the spiritual to the social, the personal to the political, the economic to the existential. We talk about the whole person undergoing transformation to become a freedom fighter and then be faithful unto death. Why? Because those who have already died, we're going to allow their afterlife to work through us. Because we're going to have Sankofa, which means we're not, we not going to move forward until we first look back and remember the best of those who came before that constitutes wind at our back. That's what stop mass incarceration is about. That's why I call it the love train. Get on the love train. Curtis Mayfield said you don't need no ticket. Just get on board. Get on board. Stop mass incarceration and decide which side you're really on and come with us, not just October 24th, but decide to be a long distance runner like Mumia Abu Jamal and so many others all the way through. Stay strong, y'all. Thank you. West, Cornell West.